Let the church say amen again. Amen. And let the church say amen one more time. Amen. amen. What a joy it is to see children up here worshiping God. Amen. amen. So as you know, today is our fifth Sunday family worship. And I heard the cries, the moans, and the agony from the parents who have been charged to sit with their children on fifth Sunday. And so, and so I'm getting some booze over here. So I decided to, to engage children, and I thank Brandon and Gabby for coming up here and leading our children and singing and in the devotional so that they can know that we love them, we care about them, and we want them to be a part of the collective assembly as we worship. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I want to invite you to uh, the subject this morning Finding Jesus in our feelings. Finding Jesus in our feelings. There are monumental events that happen in our life that bring us much joy, much excitement, much pleasure. And it's easy for us, I think, to find Jesus in these exciting moments. Maybe it's your baptism. An exciting moment in which we have found Jesus. Maybe it's the baptism of a friend or a family member where you can see Jesus working in this person's life for their salvation. Maybe it was your wedding day where you can see Jesus working in your life. Maybe it was the birth of a child or a grandchild or a niece where you can see Jesus working in your life and the lives of others. Maybe it's the cancer-free diagnosis. Amen? Amen? There are many individuals here today who uh, were plagued with cancer just a few months ago, but now are, are cancer-free. Praise God! That excites feelings in us that, uh, of excitement, of amazement, of praise, that we can rejoice, and it's easy to find Jesus and experiences like this. Maybe you got the job that you prayed for, or maybe you're returning home from deployment or visiting family because you are a full-time soldier in active duty. Good to see you, Jared. Love you, brother. But these are times when we can see Jesus in our lives because we feel so good about what God is doing for us. But what about the times that aren't so joyous? What about the times when there's sadness, when there's grief? Maybe there is a terminal diagnosis in which you are not loosed from. Maybe you are recovering from divorce and you're plagued with, with grief and despair and hopelessness. How do you find Jesus in a situation like that? Maybe you're dealing with the loss of a loved one. I know for a fact there are people here grieving right now, this morning, sitting in the audience because of the loss of a loved one. How do you find Jesus with feelings of grief? Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you're living with past trauma of abuse in your life. Maybe you're suffering from mental health issues such as anxiety and depression and schizophrenia. How do you find Jesus when you don't have those moments of excitement and joy and amazement? How do we find Jesus in our uncomfortable feelings? It can be difficult. People like to call these particular feelings on the screen negative feelings. I don't like to use that term negative feelings. It was brought out to me in a Bible class that feelings aren't good or bad. They're not positive or negative. But the ones that we consider negative, I would like to say they're just uncomfortable. How do we find Jesus in our uncomfortable feelings, our feelings of shame, of guilt, of anger, humiliation, anxiety, embarrassment, hopelessness, despair, sadness? Regret, depression. Many of you know I am a counselor therapist by trade. Therefore, I meet a lot of people in broken situations. And 90% of them 
can't find their way to Jesus when they experience these negative emotions. So I want to present to you today some ideas about emotions, and hopefully we can look at the life of Christ and see that Christ is extremely relatable when dealing with uncomfortable emotions. And hopefully you can find Christ even in the midst of your emotional crisis. Church, I'm here to tell you this morning that emotions are important. Amen? It's a universal fact that human beings are all born with emotions. Therefore, emotions are purposeful, they're useful, and they're needed. Unfortunately, many of us have not been properly educated on the significance of emotions and the function that they play in our lives. And that's why emotions sometimes gets a bad rap. Some estimate emotions to be useless. Some say that emotions are unnecessary. Some say that emotions are in opposition to reality, and sometimes they are, but I disagree with the idea that emotions are unnecessary. Emotions are vitally important to us as human beings. For emotions assist us in survival. It is the feeling of fear that encourages us to decide to fight for survival or to flee for safety. Furthermore, emotions help us to know that something is wrong in our relationships. Feelings of anger, humiliation, and embarrassment signal to us that something undesirable has just happened. And when we feel these uncomfortable emotions, it causes us to take action to set boundaries in relationships. Also, emotions are amoral which means emotions are neither right nor wrong. They just are. It is how we express our emotions that make them morally significant. But the emotion itself is neither right nor wrong. Emotions are affected by the fall of man. Going back to the garden, we see Adam and Eve partake of the forbidden fruit, and we know that act of rebellion and disobedience towards God resulted in a cascade of negative consequences. Not only has our mortality been affected by the fall, not only has our conscience and our morals been affected by the fall, but church, I believe our emotions have also been affected by the fall of man. Emotions in a fallen world can be used in a manipulative way in order for us to get what we want from others. Amen? For instance, people will often attempt to invoke feelings of of guilt and shame to get us to do things that they want us to do. And that's the reason why emotions at times gets a bad rap. Some people use anger and aggression to control others by invoking fear in them. Our emotions are affected by the fall. We often feel guilty for telling someone no when we know that is the right thing to do. But that feeling of guilt makes us think that maybe I should say yes. Our emotions are affected by the fall. So as Christians, we are not to allow our emotions uh, to interpret and guide every circumstance that we find ourselves in. That would be dangerous. That would be immature. That would be a lack of faith to allow your life to be guided by your emotions. But I will also say that God has not designed us to be Christian Stoics either. Where we are void of emotion. Where we have become apathetic, emotionless. Where we have a theology void of feelings. God has made us emotional beings, and he expects us to be able to use these emotions in our daily life. There is a debate among scholars and theologians 
And they often ask the question, is God passable or is God impassable? Passable means capable of filling or suffering, meaning that God experiences emotions and has an emotional response to us and our circumstances as he relates to us in this life. Or is God impassable? Meaning that God is emotionless, that God is indifferent, that God is cold and distant and apathetic towards us. This is a real debate among scholars. Church, our God that we serve is passable. The God that we serve is intimately and emotionally involved in our lives to the point that God can feel and he relates and moves in response to how we feel. Amen, church. If humanity is made in the image of God and humanity is emotional, it must follow that God is an emotional God. Amen? We often associate our image with God with, with being logical, with being rational, with being beings who think, who love, who are moral. Relationships. The ability to create, to have dominion over the world as God has dominion over us. However, we often neglect our emotionality and its divine origins. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says, The Son is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Church, we see and experience God more accurately through the life of Christ. Amen? So that's what I want us to do this morning. I want us to look at the life of Christ and let's see the uncomfortable emotions that he experienced. And hopefully looking at the life of Christ will encourage you, will equip you to live a faithful life in service to God in spite of your uncomfortable feelings. Amen? Amen. What we know concerning Christ can also be said about God because God is the invisible image. Jesus is the invisible image of God. Looking at the life of Christ, you may know that Christ felt compassion. Christ became angry. Christ was often indignant. The Bible says he was consumed with zeal. He was troubled. He was greatly distressed, very sorrowful, depressed, deeply moved and grieved. He sighed, he wept, he sobbed, he groaned, he was in agony. He was surprised and amazed, he rejoiced greatly, he was full of joy, he greatly desired, and he loved. When you look at the Gospels, the accounts of of Christ, the above emotions were observed by onlookers, or eyewitnesses of Jesus. That's significant in my opinion because we know that Jesus did not write a single word in the Gospels. So as we look at Christ and his emotional response, this informs me that Jesus was was emotionally expressive. Amen? that people saw Jesus in these vulnerable, raw, emotional states, and they wrote down what they saw. Church, it's okay to have emotions, and it's okay to express them. Point number one. Feelings are to be felt. Feelings are to be felt. When experiencing uncomfortable emotions, 
we often avoid these emotions. Sometimes we suppress these emotions or, or we dismiss these emotions, not wanting to feel them, not wanting to acknowledge their presence in our lives, but emotions are meant to be felt. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, Paul says, be angry, but sin not. What is Paul doing here? He's telling the church at Ephesus, get upset, get angry, deal with your anger, feel your anger, express your anger, be angry, but put your anger under the submission of God. He says, be angry, but do not sin. And we're going to see this in the life of Christ, where Christ became angry and yet did not sin sin. Feelings are meant to be felt. In Mark chapter 3, looking at verse 5, this is a scenario, if you look back at verse number 1, where Jesus has entered the synagogue and there's a man there with a paralyzed hand. And the Jews in the synagogue are watching Jesus intently to see what he's going to do with this man with this paralyzed hand. And so Jesus says to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save a life or to kill? And so Jesus goes over to this man with his paralyzed hand, and he heals this man. But look at the emotions of Christ at these religious people on Saturday morning worship. He looked around at them in what? In anger. And it says he was deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. For Jesus, in worship, religious people were getting on his nerves. Could you imagine? Do church people get on your nerves sometime? It happens. And Jesus here in this situation was willing to experience and feel these uncomfortable emotions in the context of worship. Anger, deeply distressed, deeply troubled, but why? because of the lack of compassion and empathy and sympathy from religious people who had stubborn hearts, who could worship God, but not have compassion on their fellow man. What, what else is interesting about this text is that Jesus felt two emotions simultaneously. He felt anger and he felt grief. Sometimes when we go through life and we're experiencing something negative and we have these uncomfortable feelings, you may feel more than one feeling. And it's important for you to know that so you can process and deal with those feelings correctly. Jesus was angered because of the apathy of the Pharisees, of these Jews. But he was also grieved, he was also sorrowful because he knew that they were living beneath God's blessings. He knew their spiritual state, and he knew if they did not repent, if they did not learn to find compassion and sympathy and empathy for their fellow man, that they would be doomed to eternal fire. And he, that, that grieved Jesus. He was sorry for their, for their soul, for their spiritual state. Church, Jesus is angry when we neglect to respond to the needs of others, especially in the name of of religion. What else is significant is that even in, in anger and grief and sorrow, 
Jesus served others. Why? Why is that important? I often tell people who come in and talk to me and they're dealing with, with depression and with grief and with sorrow, I, I try to get them to open up their perspective and I encourage them to find a way to serve others in the midst of these uncomfortable feelings. Giving fosters emotional well-being. The Bible says that giving is healing. It is more blessed to do what? To give than to receive. Blessing fosters emotional well-being. It's, it should give you joy. It does give you joy to be able to serve others. I remember we were doing Community Blitz, and Tawana had came to me, um, and she said, Brother, I wasn't in worship. I'm sorry, but I just got here, and I want to help and serve pizzas. She opened up her phone, and she began to show me her, her, her bedroom, and her ceiling had failed. And that's why she wasn't able to make up to worship. And she said, I was, I, was, I was angry. I was hurt. I was worried. I didn't know how I was going to pay for this. She said, she said, you know what? There was nothing I could do about the situation. But I knew that I signed up for Community Blitz. And I knew that even in the midst of this pain, I can still serve others. And she said, brother, I'm so glad I'm here. I'm so glad I came. And I feel better now than I did before. Amen. Find a way to serve and give in the midst of your uncomfortable feelings. You ever had a gut feeling? You ever been in a situation and you knew that something just wasn't right? You can feel it in your gut? Some may call it intuition. Well, remember, feelings are meant to be felt. And so a gut feeling is a real feeling. It's a... It's a physiological response to an emotional state. Emotions activate bodily sensations. In other words, we, we feel what we feel. In Matthew chapter 14, the verse is 14. Let me give you a little context here. Jesus had just been informed that his first cousin, John the Baptist, was beheaded, was murdered, was killed by Herod the Tetrarch. And so word got to Jesus, and the Bible says in Matthew 14, verse 13, when Jesus heard about this, he withdrew himself by way of a boat, and he went to a remote place to be alone. Church, Jesus was grieving. He had just lost the family member who baptized him. Jesus is sorrowful. Jesus is sad, so much so that he leaves. He deserts these people, his disciples, and he goes to a place far off, and he goes to be alone. There is a time in our life when grief has stricken us, that we need some alone time, amen? We need time to be alone to, to process the grief that we are feeling. But let's see how much alone time Jesus had. And then it goes on to say in verse 13, when the crowds heard this, that, that Jesus had went off to grieve alone, they followed him on foot from the town. And in verse 14, as he stepped ashore, he saw a huge crowd and felt compassion for them, and he healed their sick. In the midst of grief, the crowd was still wanting a blessing from Jesus. Jesus was able to get a long time, process his grief, and then re-engage in ministry. Church, that's difficult. When you're going through an emo emotional storm, it's really hard to concentrate on other people, isn't it? Feelings are meant to be felt. This word, compassion, it literally means to be moved in the inward parts, especially the nobler entrails, the heart, the lungs, the livers, and the kidneys. Kidneys. 
Jesus felt physiologically the compassion that he had for fellow man in the midst of his grief. What we feel emotionally is felt in the body. Perhaps that's the reason why we avoid unpleasant emotions, because we feel them twice. When it comes to these uncomfortable feelings, Jesus gave himself permission to feel them. But in today's society, that's looked down upon. We're told not to be angry, not to be sad, not to be grieved, not to be depressed, not to be anxious. But does that take our feelings away? No, it just dismisses them. We ought to be willing to feel what we feel because feelings are meant to be felt. But we also need to give people permission to feel what they feel too, especially children. Telling people to not feel a particular way does not eliminate the emotion. It doesn't give people permission to feel. The compassion of Jesus moved him closer to people, especially those in distress. We often see people who are suffering physically and emotionally, and we feel for them that sympathy we feel with them, that's empathy, but do we have compassion towards them? Jesus put his empathy into action. That church is compassion. Compassion is emotionally responding to the needs of others. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Not only are feelings are to be felt, feelings are also for fellowship. Feelings are for fellowship. Fellowship, koinonia, the Greek word means to share. And I believe that we can have an emotional sharing with one another. Amen? In John chapter 11, uh, looking at verse 33, this is a scenario, a situation we're all familiar with where Jesus' close friend has just died, Lazarus. So Jesus has experienced a lot of grief in his life. He's dealt with the death of his first cousin who baptized him, and now here he is with, with Mary and Martha, who were some dear disciples to him, and their brother Lazarus has just died. The Bible tells us that Jesus loved Mary and Martha, and it also tells us that he, he loved Lazarus. And he had just gotten news that Lazarus was sick. And Mary and Martha sent for Jesus. They sent for Jesus to come heal Lazarus, but Jesus postpones his departure. He waits a couple days before he starts the journey. And then finally he arrives. And before he gets into town, Mary and Martha come and meet him, and they say, Jesus, if you had been here on time when we petitioned you, our brother would not have died. It says, when Jesus saw her, her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. In verse 33, it says, He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Some translations may say that he was angry and he grieved. These are some strong, uncomfortable emotions. Here he is, angry and grieving, filling two emotions at the same time. To be troubled literally means to, to snort like a horse, the Greek translation. It means to snort with, with rage. Could you imagine Jesus 
the Son of God in His human form on earth, watching these people mourn, weep, cry, stricken with grief. And here Jesus is, he, he, he snored and he's so angry, he too has entered the emotional storm and people see Jesus in this vulnerable state. He's, he's, he's crying. And he probably looks very ugly while he's doing it. And very uncomfortable. But he wasn't afraid to express himself emotionally. But I find it interesting that Jesus doesn't respond with this type of emotional reaction until he meets Mary and her suffering and the crowd and their suffering. John 11, verse 35, it says, Jesus wept. Well, why was Jesus weeping if he knew he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead? Jesus understood the significance of relationships. He knew that Lazarus, some believe that Jesus knew that Lazarus would die again. Therefore, Jesus wept over the consequences of sin. But church, I believe Jesus wept because he was willing to respond and enter into the emotional storm with others who were also grieving. Amen? God mourns with us in our pain and suffering. This is the passability of God where our emotions move him towards us. Emotions help us get what we want from others. For example, feelings of sadness indicate our desire to be comforted and close to another person. In Psalms chapter 34, verse 18, it says, The Lord is what? He's close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. When our hearts are broken, we feel detached from God at times. We feel that God isn't close. We feel that he isn't near. But the scripture says he is closer to us when we are broken. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3. Paul says, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together there with them. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. The Hebrew writer appeals to our imagination and our ability to empathize with others. When we see people and hear about people in unfortunate situations. The Hebrew writer is saying, imagine yourself. Imagine yourself there with them. Don't disassociate yourself from them to where you cannot feel for them or with them, but imagine yourself there with them so you can feel what they feel. This is empathy, church. And a lot of times we can't fellowship with people and share in their uh, emotional state because we have not tried to imagine ourselves there with them. In Romans chapter 12, verse 15, remember, feelings are for fellowship. Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. This implies an authentic relationship void of pretense. When people are rejoicing, we should be rejoicing. Amen? Amen. How many times do people rejoice and, and we're mourning because they're rejoicing? Sometimes we get it wrong. Or when other people are, are, are rejoicing, you know, it's woe is me. Well, look at my situation. Well, things are turning out the way that I, that I planned them. And so we're mourning while others are rejoicing. But Jesus is saying through Paul, he's saying, put away your personal issues and connect with people on an emotional basis. When they rejoice, rejoice with them. When they're sorrowful, grieved, and depressed, you mourn with them. This implies self-disclosure and vulnerability, something that we have a hard time with, church. 
God expects us to enter into the joy and the storm of one another. Amen? Point number three, feelings are fleeting. Church, uncomfortable feelings don't last forever. Amen? And sometimes our uncomfortable feelings are, are within us more often than we would like for them to be, but they're temporary. And a lot of times we make permanent decision based on temporary feelings. Amen. Psalms 30, verse 50. For his anger is fleeting, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay the night, but joy comes in the morning. Our God who is passable, even his uncomfortable emotions are temporary towards us. Amen? In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 4, it says, There is a time for everything, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. God doesn't want us to sit and live in our uncomfortable feelings. They're temporary. So when there's a time that you are not feeling anxious, when you're not feeling depressed, when you're not feeling sorrowful, when you're not feeling hopeless, embrace that moment. Live in that moment. Rejoice in that moment. What's the application? Much of our negative behavior is the result of not knowing how to handle or cope with unpleasant feelings. Shame, anger, sadness, helplessness, embarrassment, disappointment, frustration. So what are some things that we can do? Here are seven things that we can do with our uncomfortable feelings. Number one, we must resolve that these feelings are not bad, but simply uncomfortable. Number two, name it to tame it. The right side of our brain is our emotional side. Our left side is our logical side. When you can put a label to your emotions, it calms the brain. Name it to tame it. Number three, stay in touch and aware of your unpleasant feelings. Be present with them. Experience them. Process them. Number four, give yourself permission to feel them and choose how to express them. Number five, refrain from emotional distractions such as drugs, social media, shopping, and eating. Number six, find someone to connect with. Feelings are for fellowship. And number seven, look for an opportunity to serve just as Jesus. Philippians 1.8, God can testify how I long for you with the affection or the compassion of Jesus. Church, Paul embodied the emotions of Christ. Therefore, we must be so close to Christ that we know his heart so well so that we can respond to others with the same emotional intelligence. Amen? As I close, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who was unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, but did not sin. Church, Christ can relate to us on a very uncomfortable emotional level. When you think Jesus is emotionally unrelatable, go back to the Garden of Gethsemane. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Here Jesus is in his most emotional state in his life. He's at the Garden of Gethsemane pending his death, his crucifixion. And here he is with his disciples and he's saying, Pray that you do not fall into temptation. And it says that he went about a stone's throw, and then he himself went down and prayed. 
And his prayer was, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will be done, but yours. Do you see Jesus in this vulnerable state? In his humanity, he's praying to God. He's saying, if the world can be saved through another means, God, my Father, let that be so, but let your will be done. I believe that this church, it's my personal belief that this was Jesus' temptation. It was at this moment where Jesus could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world, but he decided to die on the cross to set us free. And here he is in the garden, extremely stressed and agonized. And the Bible said that an angel appeared from heaven and strengthened him. And then it says in verse 44, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And the Bible says that his, his sweat became like drops of blood. Do you understand what kind of emotional state you would have to be in for your sweat to be or to turn or to be mixed with blood. According to the Indian Journal of Derm Dermatology, there's a term they use called hemo hematohydrosis. It is a very rare condition in which an individual sweats blood. And it may occur in an individual who is suffering from extreme emotional stress. Fear and intense mental contemplation are often the causes of this blood sweat. Do you see how significant the garden is? Do you see the uncomfortable emotions that Jesus had to experience? I just want, to, I want you to understand this because Jesus is relatable and I'm, I'm coming to a close when you think about Christ and his relationship with God the Father, remember that Jesus is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. So before he was born incarnate into this earth, he was in an eternal, divine, loving relationship with God the Father. In perfect love. In perfect community with the Father and the Holy Spirit, as the Word, the Bible tells us in John chapter 1. So Jesus had never been disconnected from God throughout eternity. Jesus was about to experience for the first time separation from God. Imagine you as a child who grew up with both your parents. The moment you are born, the only thing that you know that is secure is your relationship with your parent because they have been with you for every facet of your life until they're not. The death of a child and the death of a parent are some of the most traumatic, emotionally draining experiences that anyone can go through. And here Jesus is in the garden about to be separated for the first time from God. You better believe he was tempted. He had never felt this way before. And yet he still served God and gave in to God's will so that you and I can have a relationship with God the Father. And of course we know the end. He goes to the cross. He dies. And the most glorious, wonderful part is he's what? He's resurrected. He was risen from the dead, back in connection with God, his Father, to live with eternity in heaven. If you're here this morning, I hope that this inspires you, that even in the midst of uncomfortable feelings, that you can still align yourself with the will of God and in your uncomfortable feelings that you can still find Jesus.
because he is relatable not only in our joy and in our rejoicing and in our healing, but also in our pain and in our grief. If you are here and you need to respond to this message, we're going to sing a song of invitation. You can come to the front. You can go to the back. There are going to be men. Their elders are ready to pray with you, to take your request if you're here. And maybe you haven't responded to the gospel. Maybe you haven't been saved. Maybe that sin is still in your life. God is pleading with you right now to come forward. Trust him. Put Christ on in baptism. Have your sins washed away and be reconciled in a relationship with God. That was the purpose for Jesus in Gethsemane. When we all together stand and sing the song of invitation. Who breaks the power of sin and God?